Open your Bibles, the book of Acts, chapter 13. It is a wonderful joy and blessing to be back at the Great Lighthouse Baptist Church in Theodore, Alabama. I'll be forever grateful for that day when God allowed my path to cross with Dr. and Mrs. Randy Toole, the Toole family, and I believe knitted our hearts together. They're not acquaintances, they're not associates, but they're actual friends. And I'm always excited and elated when I look in my calendar and see an approaching date when I'm to be here at the Great Lighthouse Baptist Church. I've said it both publicly and privately. What I so appreciate about my dear friend, Dr. Toole, is his stand and his spirit. Not just his spirit and not just his stand, but his stand and his spirit. Some would have us believe today that to be used of God, you have to be as mean as a junkyard dog with rabies. But that is not the case. And I appreciate the fact that uh, Dr. Toole uh, is uh, a gentleman and also a great man of God. I so appreciate uh, all of the singing, the choir, the special music, the congregational singing. And I believe already there is a atmosphere there is a agenda for revival. God is in the revival business. I wouldn't uh, spend my life literally living out of a suitcase if I didn't believe that from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet. God is in the revival business. And what he's done in the past and on the pages of the Bible, he's interested in doing in the present. And so I appreciate this whole day, these two services this morning and uh, this afternoon being given to revival. Book of Acts chapter 13, and I'll begin reading with verse number 14 through verse number 16 where we find the text of the message. Book of Acts chapter 13 beginning with verse number 14 through verse number 16. And I would invite you to stand with me as I read the Word of God. Dr. Toole, the other day I heard about a lady who had uh, bought a brand new baby grand piano. And uh, probably it wasn't many days that passed, about two, and uh, there rang her doorbell, a man in coveralls uh, holding a toolbox. And when she opened the door, he gave to that lady uh, a business card had his name on it, and it said, Piano Repairman. She said, I don't remember calling a piano repairman. He said, you didn't, your neighbors did. <laughs> and you may not remember calling an evangelist, but God did, and he's here. Book of Acts chapter 13, beginning with verse number 14 through uh, verse number 16. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Then Paul stood up, and beckoning with his hand said, Men of Israel, and ye that fear God, give audience. Please look back with me at verse number 15. Book of Acts chapter 13 and verse number 15. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. There is in this verse a little phrase that right recently caught and captured my attention. I'm praying that it would do the same for you. It is that small phrase, say on. Just two words, say on. Do you see it? There it is, say on. And for a few moments, I want to speak to you on the subject this morning. Say on, preacher. Say on. 
Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this privilege to stand behind a sacred desk to preach the Word of God. If in my heart I want to be a blessing, but the only way that I can be is if you hide me behind the cross and fill me with the Spirit. Place a hedge around this great church by the blood of Christ to keep the devil and his demons from hindering this service. Save the sinner and stir the saint. Heavenly Father, for all that you'll do in our midst and even in our hearts this morning, we will be careful to give you all the praise and honor and glory. Bless and protect my precious family as I'm away. Give us fresh, warm bread from the oven of heaven to feed from this morning. And Lord, I'd request, oh, how I would request that you'd clothe me in my calling. For we ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. You may be seated. Every person in the pew has the biblical privilege to expect certain eternal principles and precepts to come from every preacher in the pulpit. Topics like Calvary, consecration, commission of the church, consecration, and countless others should not be as scarce in sermons as a drinking fountain in the Mojave Desert. The anticipation of the congregation should be more than met by the articulation of the clergy. Say on, preacher, say on. In the book of Acts chapter 13, we find the apostle Paul's sermon in the synagogue at Antioch in Pisidia. Its theme is justification by faith. Now, this chapter could be easily or effortlessly outlined like this. A great decision, verses 1 through 3. A gracious deputy, verses 4 through 12. A grievous disappointment, verse 13. A glorious declaration, verses 14 through 41. A gentle delegation, verses 42 through 49, and then a grim departure, verses 50 through 52. It is while the physician Luke is dealing under the direct inspiration of the Holy Spirit with a glorious declaration that a person reads a heart-captivating small phrase. Verse 15, and after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. This very same thing, Dr. Toole, took place during the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, earthly ministry. Luke 4, 16, and he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Evangelist Oliver B. Green once uh, wrote about our text, this uh, was the customary order of worship in the synagogue. He went on to write, after the opening formalities and prayers, someone read aloud from the books of the law, and the readings were so arranged that the entire Pentateuch was read through in order in the course, in the course of three years. And then Oliver B. Green simply ties up this thought by writing, after the reading of the designated passage, the rulers of the synagogue would call on whomsoever they would as speaker on that occasion or uh, any members of the congregation could ask permission to speak. There are two small, 
overlooked words that this entire narrative orbits around, and they are the tiny statement, say on. In the Greek language, it means basically to break the silence about. Never forget, the anxious ear of the pew should never go without hearing the authoritative, thus saith the Lord, voice of the pulpit. Now, if you miss everything that I preached this morning, I pray that you would not miss that. And it even bears repeating, the anxious ear, the anxious ear, the anxious ear of the pew should never go without hearing the authoritative, thus saith the Lord, voice of of the pulpit. Friend, you and I, both the unsaved and the saved, uh, ought to sit on the edge of our seats when hearing eternal statements shouting, say on, preacher, say on. Now, quickly this morning, there are at least three truths that a pew should be eager to hear about from a pulpit and they're all found in the Apostle Paul's first sermon to the Gentiles here in Acts chapter 13. Let's quickly notice it this morning. Say on, preacher, say on. Number one, the artisan of salvation. Verse 23, of this man's seed hath God according to his promise raised unto Israel a Savior Jesus. A truth that the pew should be eager to hear about from the pulpit is the artisan of salvation. Now that word artisan uh, simply means a worker in a skilled trade, especially one uh, that involves making things by hand. Keep that in mind, for we will be coming back to it momentarily. In verse 23, the physician Luke tells us that the Apostle Paul makes the sure and swift transition in his sermon from David to the divine Son of God. As someone as well said, of the Moses of the New Testament, all sermons uh, in Paul's preaching led to Christ. He plainly and yet powerfully introduced his audience not to a martyr of religion, but a savior of the world. No wonder the songwriter would take the songwriter's pen and place upon songwriter's paper those soul-penetrating words, majestic sweetness sits enthroned upon the Savior's brow, his head with radiant glories crowned, his lips with grace or flow. He saw me plunged in deep distress and flew to my relief, for me, he bore that shameful cross and carried all my grief. His hand a thousand blessings pours upon my guilty head. His presence gilds my darkest tower and there guards my sleeping bed. Now a person can call the Lord Jesus Christ of the artisan of salvation one who makes things with his hands because the scriptures gives us these fascinating facts about both uh, his uh, earthly and eternal ministry. Uh, he uh, was a carpenter. Is not this the carpenter? Mark 6, 3. His sinless hands were nailed to an old rugged cross. They pierced my hands and my feet. Psalm twenty two sixteen. 16. Uh, then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger and behold my hands. John 20 and 27. And he is at this very moment leading the construction crew in heaven. In my father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. John 4. 14 to amen, amen, and amen. Friend, you and I ought to be sitting on the edge of our seat shouting, say on, preacher, say on, when hearing about the artisan of salvation. The Bible says in Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Listen closely, creeds, communion, catechism, 
charitable donations, cycling around the neighborhood with a white shirt, an ugly necktie, and a nameplate, or a thousand and one other things won't get your sins forgiven, but trusting Christ and Him alone will. All you and I ought to be sitting on the edge of our seats as shouting, say on, preacher, say on, when hearing about the artisan of salvation. Once was a dear child of God that was on her deathbed and there came into her hospital room uninvited, a Catholic priest. He told her that he was there to absolve her of all of her sins. She politely asked to, to see his hands, examine them closely and then said, no, you're completely unqualified to take away my sins. Surprised, the priest queried, I don't understand what you mean. I'm a priest of the Holy Catholic Church and appointed by the bishop uh, to my parish. The dear woman replied, I don't know anything about all that. But what I do know is the one who forgave me of all of my sins, uh, there saved my wretched soul and very soon uh, is going to welcome me into heaven, had nail-pierced hands, uh, and his name is the lovely Lord. Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, you and I ought to be sitting on the edge of our seats uh, shouting, say on, preacher, say on, when hearing about the artisan of salvation. Number two, let me hasten. And I know I'll get stuck here. Number two, the access of salvation. Please look at it, verse 26. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. A truth that the few should be eager to hear about from the pulpit is the access of salvation. In verse 26, the physician, physician Luke tells us that the apostle Paul puts out the welcome mat before all people in regards to the free and forever pardon of sin. One Bible student wrote of this scene in the Scriptures. Here Paul's invitation included Gentiles, proselytes, all who are within the sound of his voice. Justification by faith is for all. Now can I go ahead and preach this morning? The only way that a person could miss the wonderful whosoever will doctrine in the Bible, the only way a person could miss that would be to try to read the Bible closed, uh, upside down, and translate it in Martian. That is the only way that a person could miss the wonderful whosoever will doctrine in the Bible. Sheila, muse on that for a moment. Friend, you and I ought to be sitting on the edge of our seat shouting, say on, preacher, say on, when they're hearing about the excess of salvation. Now, there's several tenets or truths that uh, unmistakably teach that God wants everyone to be saved. Now, it may shock you, it may stun you, it may even surprise you, but first of all, the passion of the cross. Luke 23, 34, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots, a tenant or a truth that unmistakably teaches that God uh, wants uh, everyone to be saved is the passion of the cross. Well, crowned in thorns and robed in blood, the Son of God makes clear that nobody is ever ushered away from Calvary unable to be saved. Friend, if you die and go to hell, you won't be able to blame God the Father. If you die and go to hell, you'll not be able to blame God the Son. If you die and go to hell, you'll not be able to blame God the Holy Ghost. But if you die and go to hell, the only person you can blame is yourself. The passion of the cross. Secondly, the plan of the church 
Mark 16, 15, and he said unto them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, a tenet or a truth that unmistakably teaches that God wants everyone to be saved is the plan of the church. Uh, common sense, Dr. Toole says, uh, God wouldn't ask the local church to be in the every reacher creature business if he had not authorized them to be in the every reacher creature business. <laughs> Don't make me say that again. The plan of the church. Thirdly, the prayer of the Christian. Romans 10, 1, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. A tenet or a truth that unmistakably teaches that God wants everyone to be saved is the prayer of the Christian. You'll never convince the believer who just saw God answer a prayer in the saving of a friend, a fellow worker, or a family member member that he isn't concerned with saving others too. All oh, that every person that is in this service would realize this morning that the tenets or the truths that unmistakably teach that God wants everyone to be saved is the passion of the cross, the plan of the church, and the prayer of the Christian. When the Prince of Wales visited India, there are a number of high caste people who are waiting to shake hands with him and there was a big barrier uh, there separating them from the masses of the people. The prince arrived, shook hands with those who are presented to him and then looking over their heads, oh my, to the crowds beyond said, take those barriers down. They were taken down and everyone who liked had free access and a welcome from the son of an emperor. The next time the prince came that way, 10,000 outcasts gathered under a banner that they had made, and they put on the banner this statement, the prince of the outcasts. Hey, child of God, when you and I trusted Christ, uh, we too uh, came under that warm and welcoming banner, for truly he is the prince uh, of the outcasts. The access of salvation. And then number three, and last of all, and I'm out like Rosie O'Donnell in a beauty contest. I know Dr. Toole says that all the time around here. <laughs> Not only, not only uh, there, uh, the uh, artisan of salvation and the access of salvation, but number three, and last of all, the authenticity of salvation. Verse 30, but God raised him from the dead. Verse 30, but God raised him from the dead. Verse 30, but God raised him from the dead. I was having my devotions this morning, verse 30. But God raised him from the dead. Mrs. Hamlin texted me before I left the room, and it said, none of your business, verse 30. But God raised him from the dead. We are on our way to the service. We passed the billboard. It said, verse 30. But God raised him from the dead. Preacher picked me up late last night at the airport. We stopped for Chinese food, and you can't have Chinese food without having an egg roll. Somebody say amen right there, and a fortune cookie. And inside the fortune cookie, it said, verse 30. 30. It didn't, but that's good preaching. Verse 30, but God raised him from the dead. A truth that the, you wanted it all in one day, you're getting it. A truth that the pew should be eager to hear about from the pulpit is the authenticity of salvation. In verse 30, the physician Luke tells us that the apostle Paul makes an important excursion in his sermon to the cemetery to tell about the greatest affirmation of Christianity, which is the resurrection of Christ. The fact that Jesus rose from the dead was well attested 
And there were those in the crowd who saw his miracles, heard his teaching, but far more importantly, stood at the edge of his empty grave, and they were witnesses that could not be denied. Dr. John R. Rice once said, the resurrection of Jesus Christ cannot be overestimated in importance. The victorious resurrection there puts a divine exclamation point behind the virgin birth and the vicarious death. Friend, you and I are going to be sitting on the edge of our seat shouting, say on, preacher, say on, when hearing about the authenticity of salvation. The Bible says in 2 Peter 1, 16, for we have not followed cunning, devised fables uh, when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were our witnesses of his majesty. If the stone was not rolled away, key word if, if the stone was not rolled away, key word if, if the stone was not rolled away, did I mention key word if, I would borrow a cigarette lighter from a Baptist deacon. Everybody knows if anybody has a cigarette lighter, it is a Baptist deacon. He's holding it for his wife. <laughs> if the stone was not uh, rolled away, uh, I would there get uh, a cigarette lighter from a Baptist deacon and burn all the pews, all the hymn books, uh, all the offering plates, uh, the pulpit, the Lord's Supper table, and even the church bell with the steeple. But since the stone was rolled away. I'd give that Baptist deacon back his cigarette lighter before he goes into a nicotine fit. The authenticity of salvation. I'm closing with this. Some time ago, I read about Michelangelo. Now, I need to interject. I'm not talking about one of the Ninja Turtles. other night, Dr. Tool, I was preaching in a great conference, and I quoted Michelangelo. And in the middle of the quote, I felt that crowd needed a little help. And so I slammed on the brakes, and I said, I don't mean a ninja turtle. And I watched as the moderator on the platform pulled out a pen and wrote in the flight of his Bible, not the ninja turtle. Ah, <laughs> uh, you can't beat Bible preaching. When Michelangelo, uh, commonly known by his first name, an Italian sculptor, painter, architect, and poet of the High Renaissance period who exerted an unparalleled influence on the development of Western art, when Michelangelo there visited several art galleries in the European cities, he was deeply impressed uh, by the preponderance uh, of the paintings uh, uh, they're depicting Brother Andrew Christ dying on the cross. He asked, why are the art galleries filled with so many pictures of Christ on the cross, Christ dying? Why do the artists concentrate on that passing episode as if it were the last word and the final scene? And then Michelangelo said, Christ dying on the cross lasted for only a few hours, but to the end of unending eternity, Christ is alive, Christ rules, reigns, and triumphs. And if I may add a rider to that legendary figure of history statement, I would just simply say, in all time, Christianity is real. Oh, you and I ought to be sitting on the edge of our seats uh, shouting, say on, preacher, say on, when hearing about the authenticity of salvation. We have seen from one Bible page this morning the truths that every child of God ought to be excited and elated to hear about. You say, Dr. Hamlin, what does that have to do with revival? Well, you know, I can tell when I'm starting to get cold, and I can tell when I'm starting to get uh, calloused, and, 
I can tell when I'm starting to get carnal. And the way I tell is uh, this Bible doesn't, doesn't stir me like it used to. And I dare say, I, I dare say that I'm cut from the same bolt of humanity that you're cut from. And when the child of God can hear the great truths of the Bible and it not move us, when a child of God can hear uh, preaching Bible, preaching Sunday in uh, and Sunday out and Wednesday night in and, and Wednesday night out and it not do something to us, we're cold. We're callous. We're carnal. We're candidates for revival. I remember right after I got saved, I was saved on a Sunday morning. And uh, they told me, Mrs. Tool, after I was saved, they said, we got this thing called a Sunday night service. And I said, well, what, what's going to happen in the Sunday night service? And they said, well, we'll sing the hymns of the faith and the choir will sing and we'll have special music and the Bible will be preached. And I remember 40 years ago, I remember staring at the clock all afternoon. I remember looking at my watch all afternoon, counting down the hours when I could get to go back to the house of God and do it all over again. There's a term for that. It's called first love. Remember when you couldn't wait to get to church? Uh, remember how that first Bible, uh, you had a highlighter and, and verses that if you were like me, verses that you didn't even understand then and still don't understand now, you highlighted them four times. Turned your Bible into a coloring book. Remember that? But oh, now you've been saved a while and now you can find the book of uh, Malachi and, and now you know that it's the book of uh, Job and not Job. And by the way, if you don't have one of those, you ought to get a job. But now it's old hat. Now a preacher can start a statement and you can almost finish the statement. And now a preacher can take a text and you can pretty much figure out where he's going to go with that truth. But do you remember when you were excited? Do you remember how you couldn't wait to get to church? Do you remember how the preaching of the Word of God thrilled you and turned you to do right? If we're going to have revival... We got to get back to that excitement. If we're going to have revival, we have to get back to that enthusiasm. Say on, preacher. Say on. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. In this service this morning, there are two types of people those that are saved and those that are lost. And I wonder with every head bowed and every eye closed who would lift their hand and say, Preacher, I know that I know that I know that I know if I were to die right now, heaven is my eternal home. I'm saved and sure. You'd lift your hand and leave it saved and sure. Saved and sure. Saved and sure. Thank you, thank you. Main floor balcony, thank you. May I put them down. You're here this morning, dear one, and you couldn't, you couldn't raise your hand, but you would lift it now. And by raising it, main floor balcony, you're saying, I need to be saved. I need to trust Christ. I don't want to die and go to a devil's hell. Main floor balcony right now. Couldn't lift your hand a moment ago, but you would lift it now. Saying, preacher, pray for me. I need to be saved. I, I need to trust Christ. I don't want to die and go to hell. God bless you. I see that hand. Thank you. Thank you. I see that hand. Others, preacher, pray for me. Main floor balcony, pray for me. God bless you. I see that hand over there. Thank you, sir. Would there be another? I need to be saved. I need to trust Christ. Preacher, pray for me. Another hand. Thank you. I see it. Now, here's what I want you to do. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. You lifted your hand. I want you to look up here at me. Jesus loves you. He wants to save you. Just come on right now. Just get up and come on. Come on, get up. Just stand up. We got somebody to wait on you. That's it. You're heading the right way. You lifted your hand. You need to be saved. This dear man's going to help you right here, sir. Someone else. You need to trust Christ. You know you're lost. You know you need to be saved. You lift your hand. Just, just step up and slip out. 
Jesus loves you. He wants to save you. You know you're lost. You know you're but a heartbeat from hell, sir, ma'am. Come on. We've got, we got somebody waiting to, waiting to help you in the Bible to show you how to be saved. Would there be another? You'd lift your hand. Would there be another? Main floor, main floor, balcony, balcony. I need to be saved. I need to trust Christ. Preacher, pray for me. You're here this morning, and as a Christian, God has spoken to your heart. And you want to get back to that enthusiasm. You want to get back to that excitement that you used to have in hearing the Bible preached. And you'd lift your hand and say, Preacher, that's me. That's me. I've gotten cold, and I, God bless you there. God bless you there. Others, I've gotten cold. God bless you there. I, I've gotten carnal. Uh, man, I've gotten calloused. Preacher, I want to get back to that excitement, that enthusiasm. You'd lift your hand. Pray for me. Pray for me. You're here and need to, I don't know how to put it any other way. You'll have to forgive me. You're here and you need to old-fashioned get right with God. And you'd say, Preacher, that's me. I need to get right. I know I'm backslid. I need to get right with God. And you'd lift your hand. Preacher, pray for me. Pray for me. You're here and need to follow the Lord in believer's baptism or you're here and need to unite with the great Lighthouse Baptist Church. You've heard me say it through the years countless times. If Mrs. Hamlin and I lived within driving distance of this church, we would be members of this church and Dr. Toole would be our pastor. Now hear me, if I can give this place that type of recommendation, then certainly you could consider what the Spirit of God's been saying to your heart for weeks, if not months, about becoming a part of this faith family. You'd lift your hand and say, that's me. Preacher, that's me. God bless you there and there. Others, preacher, that's me.